Welcome to the GTU. My name is Barry Holmes. This module is going to be on glaciers, ice fields, tunnels, and ablatement. And we want to have a look at how it affects exploration, drilling, and transportation. We'll just have a quick look at glaciers. The big thing they leave behind is moraines. So what you have is where the glacier rubs against the mountain or valley wall. It picks up, grinds off dirt, rock, boulders, and takes it with it down until it stops and starts to melt back, and then it leaves gravel, rocks, and they are called moraines. At the end of the glacier, as it's going downhill from gravity, it will stop at its final terminus, and it will leave what is called a terminal moraine. On the side, to the left there you can see boulders on the glacier. Those come from rock slides, whatever, coming off of the adjacent mountain. And they may travel on that glacier for hundreds of miles. And then when the glacier melts, you've got a great big boulder out in the middle of nowhere. This is the Stein Glacier in Switzerland. Picture is on the right is from 2006 and the one on the left is from 2015. During that period, it melted back 550 meters, so that's an average melt back or ablation of about 61 meters per year. It's very interesting to read the headline to that. That was with the life science issue. A team of scientists have put together photographic proof of climate change. So, using science to prove climate change, as if we didn't know it was already there. Over the course of my years flying helicopters, I got to be involved in uh, flying over a lot of different ice fields and glaciers. For a period of time, I was based at uh, Golden, BC, and that was uh, 100 kilometers, probably, uh, south of the Columbia ice field. Columbia ice field is kind of in a bath Jasper Highway Corridor, and it's apparently one of the biggest ice fields on North America. When you look at a glacier, you can see down at the bottom there, it's got a lot of kind of dirt-covered parts of the ice, and as it's receding, you can also see there is a bit of a trail going into the where I have the arrow pointed down, receding toe, so that's where tourists can get up and have a look at it. If you look over to the center left, you can see a road going up on the edge of that moraine, and it winds up and it will actually transport you up into to the mid section of the glacier there. What happens is when you have huge temperature changes from the influence of the glacier and the snow field, which is common to all mountain winds, but it's particularly stronger when you have uh, the influence of the temperature differential that the glacier and ice fields provide. So during the evening and through the night, cool air will descend. That's called catabatic winds. But during the day, once you kind of get to mid-morning and it's warming up, you'll have winds that uh, go up the glacier, and those are called anabatic winds. And as you can see at the bottom there, the anabatic winds will carry dust and such, and it'll deposit on the lower section of the glacier. That all influences the rate of melting. On the top left of the yellow arrows, you can see that there's hanging glaciers. And that's quite a common feature. Wherever you find glaciation, you'll have hanging glaciers. Once they're gone, you'll have hanging valleys. Down below, you can see very pronounced lateral moraines. So what you have is you'll have tourists go in there, and they'll sit at the bottom with the tourist guides, and they will look how much this glacier is melting back. Oh, my God, the world's coming to an end. And then they'll look over, and oh, look at the lateral moraines. It was so big at one time. But over the course of... 10,000 years, the amount of ice is just, you know, the possibilities are immense. I don't know the exact top of where that ice field was, but you can pretty much figure it was up around that yellow line. As the glacier was moving down from the effects of gravity, you can see on the right there in the red box, that was all polished off by ice moving over it. 
So to go there and look at that glacier and say, oh my God, the world's coming to an end, it's all melting away. It's been doing that for 10,000 years, so it's not something new. Now we'll move north in BC. This is part of the Cambry Ice Field, which is in the lower Golden Triangle. And the University of Northern BC did a study on this. And over 54 years, they uh, measured that the glacier had melted back about 3,500 meters. So if you check that out, I bl believe it came to about 55 meters a year. So there seems to be some continuity in the rate of meltback. And it's something maybe we could get the companies that are working around ice fields to uh, start taking measurements. In the lower part here, you see Ascot Resources Red Mountain Mine. This is a resource that they bought so that it would be part of uh, production in future years, but they haven't constructed the roads or access to that yet. You can see where the X is, it's called a Red Mountain, and there's a reason, and we'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Now, this is a satellite image of the same area. The red line is where it was 50 years ago, and that's the melt back. And you can see the uh, structure of where the glaciers have been rubbing on the sides and carrying away uh, rock and debris. And here's Red Mountain. Very prominent feature. You can see the ice field in the background. Lower parts, you can see where the glacier's gone by. And, you know, at the lower left, it was, or lower right, it was coming around the rock shoulder. It polished that all off. And then as it comes around, it made depositions of gravel and sand, creating a moraine there in the center bottom. If you go up to Treaty Creek, now we're looking at uh, not so much ice fields, but we're definitely looking at glaciers. And so how are glaciers going to interfere with the ability to create a mine? And it was very simple. If the glacier's in the way, drive over top of it. So it's about from the highway down in the lower right there up to the mine is about 45 kilometers roughly. And they built a highway or a secondary road into the bottom of the glacier. And then they drove over the glacier up to the mine. And that allowed them to bring in a lot of the really heavy equipment they needed to build the mine. And if you look at the blue line there on the lower left, that's an approximate route of where the hydro line came in to service that mine. And having hydro available is very cost effective compared to having to bring diesel in and run generators. This is a picture of when they were constructing the power line going up. This is uh, one of the last towers before the mine. And if you look behind the tower there, you can see the glacier that they used to transport up to the mine site. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, and you're on YouTube, you can look up Rockstad Power, Ericsson Air Crane, Bruce Jack Transmission Power Line Project. There's quite a few videos on there that are uh, very interesting to watch. And that is the mine itself. And right dead center is the hydro tower coming in and you can't see it, but on the top right is that tower that we just looked at in an image. So that's the power coming into the mine. That's the mine. It was built in 2017, it was finished, and that was a billion dollar investment. The same area, Bruce Jack Mine is up near the upper part of that photo. To the right of that is Sea Bridges KSM project with their various deposits coming over the hill. In the center there down in Treaty Creek and the deposits that Tudor Gold is uh, exploring. The glaciers there are melting back at a pretty consistent rate, probably something similar to that uh, 50, 60, 70 meters a year. Over on the far right, you can see SK Mining. They uh, are also part of contributing modules to this uh, GTU project. So with uh, the Treaty Creek deposit, the Gold Storm deposit there, um, you've got the glacier, the major drilling of the deposit, fleshing out the size of the deposit was uh, done on the exposed ground, which was the side hill going down the glacier. 
but they also needed to figure out what was under the glacier and that was simple enough. They just uh, put the drills on the ice and went ahead and did their drilling there. So a lot of the holes they did were done from on top of the glacier. To the south of Treaty Creek is the world's largest undeveloped gold copper deposit owned by Seabridge Gold. They need to get their mine door over to their approved and permitted processing facility at the bottom left corner of this map. The approximate route of this 23 kilometer twin tunnel is shown as a red line on the map. The exact route is yet to be determined because it will involve attaining permission from the owners of the underlying claims. A letter from the BC government dated November 16, 2023 stated, it is the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship's position that the rights granted under the license of occupation to access and use the Crown lands are subject to the prior mineral rights held by Tudor. In my opinion, it is in the best interest of all companies in the Golden Triangle, plus the government, plus the people of BC, plus the First Nations, that this gets resolved so that both companies eventually go into production. We're looking at a potential combined 100 years of world-class gold copper production in this small pocket of the Golden Triangle. There is a reason why they call this elephant country. This is the Treaty Creek Camp. It's uh, probably hanging glaciers were influencing the moraine that you see there in number two. Uh, number one, those arrows are pointing to what are either called drumlins or they're part of a lateral moraine from the main main uh, glacier when it was up that high. And at the background there where it says glacial scouring, that is where and how high the glacier has been in the past, seven, eight thousand years ago. This is uh, down south of the Bruce Jack mine. This is the old Grand Duke mine showing up on the upper left there. And they had a 17 kilometer tunnel that they built back uh, I would think it was the 60s, 60s, early 70s. And uh, so they had a highway up or a dirt secondary road up to what is called Grand Duke East Portal. That's where they built their mine facilities and drove a 17 kilometer tunnel through to where the m deposit was. And that is also in the same area of where Scotty Gold is. Coming south of that, along the same trend, is a discovery on the Harry property by Black Wolf. And just south of that is the Ascot Premier Mine, which is a mine that started in the 1860s and has uh, been opened and shut down several times. And Ascot's now going to bring that back into production and uh, pour their first bar of gold in the uh, first quarter of 2024. And all of this is based out of Stewart at the bottom, which is the closest community. This is what it looks like inside a tunnel. They're not done for any aesthetics, but they do make them as safe as possible and they are very efficient at moving ore and moving supplies in and out. That's back to where they were drilling on the ice at Treaty Creek. Anything is possible. And for the students that have been looking at this, I'm just wondering if you noticed anything else as we were going through these slides, because it's something you should have picked up on. If you didn't, Professor John De Decker might be on your case. There's some pretty interesting Gossin showing up. But I don't think we can do anything about it because it's in a national park. Like we have all said before, please subscribe, become a member, hit the like button, share your ideas in the comments below. Thank you.